Good morning. Good morning and welcome on this Reformation Sunday as we are gathered by the Holy Spirit for the work of being constantly transformed by God, becoming God's people to live generously in God's world. Ah, speaking of living generously, what a great segue. Um, today is the first day of our uh, annual stewardship campaign, and the theme is living generously every day. You will hear themes of that, I hope, uh, throughout worship today and in the sermon. And um, please watch in your mailboxes uh, later this week for your um, packet that will contain both your pledge card and your time and talent form. A few words about both. Uh, your pledge card allows us to plan our budget for the coming year, how best we can use and steward God's resources in the year that is ahead. And so they are important to be filled out to the best of your ability. And secondly, the time and talent forms. Um, it's been a year and a half since we've gathered for worship and there are um, some gaps in our, uh, in our um, serving uh, positions. And so um, we need to know, first of all, in this year and a half, is God calling you into something new? Perhaps what you had done before is not where you feel God could best use your time and talents. And um, where might the Holy Spirit be uh, tapping you on the shoulder and calling you to serve? So I do invite you to fill one out for each member of the household, uh, letting us know where you want to serve so that we don't make mistakes and, and put you in a slot where you just really aren't feeling called. So please, again, um, uh, be uh, attentive to that. It's hugely helpful for us. This, uh, this last week was food distribution again, and we fed, uh, we handed out over 2,000 meals. One of the things that we have noticed is while every week someone seems to come up to us and say, hey, thanks so much. We really appreciate all that you've done. We now have a job. We had another one of those this week, you know, and, and she won't be coming back. But we're also noticing um, new people coming in. And so there is a constant need in our community for, for food and for that type of assistance. So thank you for your generosity and please keep those contributions uh, coming. About worship today, a reminder, um, your bulletins, some of them are marked. Uh, please note if you see a highlighted section, that's yours. You're welcome to come up to the pulpit and read that so that the folks at home can hear us. And if you are the communion assistant, please come forward and, um, and stand behind it. This week it will be this table. Um, and then we'll come forward this center aisle and then, and then come forward this way. And then over here we'll do this way and then that way. Um, so please uh, join us folks at home. Please um, have your elements ready so that you can participate as part of this family of faith in the sacrament of Holy Communion this morning. And a final uh, note, or no, a few more. Um, murmured singing, please keep those masks on unless you're speaking into a microphone. And please, six feet between non-family groups in the pews. There are lots of pews. So um, this week we've shifted those. So please try to be six feet apart from the folks you're sitting next to if they are not in your family pod. And important to know, if you are uncomfortable being on camera, um, for our folks Zooming at home, which is also being recorded, there is a camera-free zone over here. If you want to take communion without being on the camera, this is your spot. Um, so you can come up with this, this group. I, we say that, I know it sounds a little funny, but especially when there are children present, if we don't want our children um, on camera, or if you're just uncomfortable with that. We don't want you um, to, to feel that way. So uh, please, that, that has been um, set aside specifically for that purpose. Now we take in the, yes, Rhonda. Christmas trees. I know it's early, but Christmas tree sales. Uh, Rhonda's life would be oh so much easier if you just went ahead and got online and signed up. Then that would be done. She doesn't have to worry about that. Um, so please, uh, please take care of, of that if you feel 
compelled and called to participate in that ministry. Thank you, Rhonda. Is there anything else? Lots of stuff in your bulletins. Please read them. And now we take in that deep breath. Breathing in God's life-giving spirit, we breathe out all of our cares and concerns, stresses, anxieties. We leave them at the foot of the cross where Jesus takes them upon his own body. And we begin with the confession and forgiveness. I invite you to stand as you are able.
Gracious Lord, we thank you that your Holy Spirit renews the church in every age. Pour out your Holy Spirit on our faithful people. Keep them steadfast in your word. Protect and comfort them in times of trial. Defend them against all enemies of the gospel. And bestow on the church your saving peace through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. And I see Jaden is here, so I'm going to grab my mask. Let's see how this works with a mask on. All right, can everybody hear me? You hear me okay? All right. So <clears throat> we come to church, Jaden, and we hear the word of God, right? We hear uh, readings, whoops, readings out of the Bible. We sing songs that, uh, like the song we just sang um, that is in Latin and it talks about asking God for mercy. And we say prayers, we pray to God, we pray about the things we're really happy for. And we pray about the things we're sad about and the thing, people we want God to help. And then, and then we um, have communion and we're blessed and we leave church. So do you think that that's enough Jesus for the whole week? No, do you think that's all God calls us to do is just come and sit and listen? No, no. I think God asks us to respond to the things that we hear about how God promises to love and care for us and um, trusting that God has answered our prayers and will answer our prayers. We get to live <clears throat> out in the world at home and with our friends and on the playground and in the grocery store. We get to live every day responding. We know that we're loved so we can love other people. And we call that living generously. We call that living generously. That means that we trust God's promises to always love us so much that we live lives that reflect that, that show that. Like, I bet there are some things your mom asks you to do at home. Are there? Like, like can you give me an example? Is there something you do at home regularly? What is that? Mom, can you help us out? Wipe the table. Yeah, 
We don't just do it because mom says, hey, Jaden, you have to wipe the table. Wipe the table because we know that we're loved and we're part of God's family. And so we act in our own families. Let me, let me show you something. Are, are you willing to come here with me? I'm going to come back here. And I want to show you another way that we act generously here. Sorry, guys at home. We'll be right back. Do you see out there? What do you see? There by the steps. Well, the bags on the other side of the steps. You see all those cans of food? Do you know where they came from? Do you see these people in here? They each brought cans of food so that we can feed people who are hungry. That's generous living. They went to the grocery store and they thought about how much God loved them, and they brought some cans of food. And now other people can be fed and can have a good nutritious meal on their table. Isn't that wonderful? That's what living generously is. We take what we learn here about God's love and we enact it. That's, a, that's kind of a big funny word, but we act it out. We live it in our daily lives. Let's ask God to help us with that, okay? Ah, God, thank you for Jaden and that he's helpful at home. And that I saw him bring some cans of food in too. God, thank you for his generous way of living. And thank you for the generous way we all live. Help us, God, to continue to be generous with your love. And all God's children said, amen. Thanks, Jaden. You can go back to your parents. Thank you. Draw us close, Holy Spirit, as the scriptures are read and the word is proclaimed. Let the word of faith be on our lips and in our hearts, and let all other words slip away. May there be one voice we hear today, your voice of truth and grace. Amen. A reading from Jeremiah chapter 31. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant that I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, a covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. No longer shall they teach one another or say to each other, know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, says the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Psalm 46, read responsibly. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth be moved and though the mountains shake in the depths of the sea. Though its waters rage and foam and though the mountains tremble with its tumult, there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of the city. It shall not be shaken. God shall help it break at the day. The nations rage and the kingdoms shake. God speaks and the earth melts away. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our stronghold. Come now, regard the works of the Lord, what desolations God has brought against the earth. 
Behold the one who makes war to cease in all the world, who breaks the bow and shatters the spear and burns the shields with fire. Be still then and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our stronghold. invite you to stand as you are able for the reading of the Holy Gospel. The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the eighth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, if you continue in my word, you are truly my disciples and you will know the truth and the truth will make you free. And they answered him, we are descendants of Abraham and have never been slaves to anyone. What do you mean by saying you will be made free? Jesus answered them very truly, I tell you, everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not have a permanent place in the household. The son has a place there forever. So if the son makes you free, you will be free indeed. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated. Well, happy Reformation Day, everybody. Woohoo! Isn't it funny? And when we celebrate this day as Lutherans, our thoughts immediately turn to that Wittenberg door, don't they? Those 95 theses that Luther nailed upon it. We all know his story, the beginning of his story anyhow. We all know of uh, Luther who was a devoted monk and a dedicated scholar of scripture. He had an aha moment as he read Paul's letter to the Romans. It just sort of smacked him upside the head that God's love and salvation comes through faith by grace alone. We all know this principle of the justification of faith that guided the way he lived and he died, and it created for us, all of us, the foundation of our faith, right? You're with me so far. This all sounds vaguely familiar to some of you. Yes, okay, good. But what about the rest of the stuff Luther wrote? What about it? How many of you have followed up I read more of his writings. There are volumes and volumes and volumes of things that Luther has written. How many of you have read at least one of them? Hans, I know. Yeah, okay, you better put your hand up. Thank you. There's so much. There is so much more to Luther than those 95 theses. Every seminary graduate probably has in his or her library this handy dandy little book. The basic writings, the basic, uh, Martin Luther's basic emphasis on basic theological writings. I just want to point out that those 95 theses take up less than 10 pages of this book. Just saying. The remainder of the book, let me turn it facing you. The remainder of the book covers other matters of general importance to the life of every single believer. For Luther and his colleagues deduced that for a Christian being saved by grace through faith had meaning in the everyday lives of the believers. That there were responsibilities that came with the title Christian. That there are ways of responding to the grace of Jesus Christ that our are, as our liturgy has said in the past, truly meet, right, and salutary. And because in the gospel today, Jesus chooses to engage his audience over the subject of freedom, I'd like to point us to a nifty little treatise closer to the back of this book that's entitled, The Freedom of a Christian. Freedom freedom. 
there's a charged word right now if there ever was one. It's loaded politically and emotionally. Some of you are feeling your backs tense a little bit right now. Our nation has an eye on Charlottesville, Virginia at this very moment as a trial is unfolding over the 2017 Unite the Right rally that turned violent. The plaintiffs, they're accusing promoters of exhorting followers to defend the South and Western civilization from non-white people and their allies, according to the lawsuit. While on the other hand, the defendants are claiming, and this is important to our conversation today, they are claiming freedom of speech that protects their right to say all of the things they said four years ago that led to violent outbursts and the untimely death of Heather Heyer. We get all kinds of ugly. We get all kinds of ugly in this nation when we start to discuss that word freedom. Mostly, mostly because in our heads, in our heads, it is an abstract concept that assumes we live in a vacuum. It presupposes that what I do doesn't affect you. And if it does, oh well, that's not my problem. I can do and say as I, please, I'm free to do whatever makes me happy and whatever makes me feel good. I'm free to think only of me. I have rights and liberties because, well, I'm a citizen here, and this nation grants me those rights and liberties. I can carry a gun wherever I want. I can choose not to get vaccinated. I can choose not to wear a mask. I can demean people publicly on social media. I can act and speak in ways that do not take into account your needs or your feelings or even at times your very existence. And that is my God-given right. Is it? Is it? It's what we say. Is that accurate? Is that really who we're called to be? Luther says a resounding no. Jesus says an even louder no. To Luther back in 15, whatever it was, had his back against a wall. Clergy were lying. They were outright lying. They were leading congregations astray, freely spreading false information about the kingdom of God to amass great wealth for themselves and to build St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. It was horrid, horrid, promising to fast track people on the way to heaven with a few coins and a sheet of paper, creating an illusion that money could buy one's way to salvation. And so Luther wrote this document. He wrote this document about freedom because in the middle of all that confusion, in the middle of conflicting messages, it was necessary to define the word once and for all. And so he wrote, and I quote, a Christian is perfectly free Lord of all, subject to none. A Christian is a perfect perfectly dutiful servant of all, subject to all. Listen to that again. A Christian is a perfectly free Lord of all, subject to none. A Christian is a perfectly dutiful servant of all, subject to all. In this oxymoron, what Luther is saying is that we have been freed in Christ. We are free. Freed in Christ, no longer bound to sin, no longer slaves to the whims of the flesh. We are not doomed to hell because of our actions. And that was a freedom, my friends, that was costly beyond measure. Jesus bore such a weight freely for us on the cross as an act of pure grace. We didn't deserve it. We didn't earn it. It was a gift gift wrapped in a great big box with a big shiny bow on it, the most precious gift of all. And 
there's an and. The fruits of that freedom are lives that are filled with gratitude and generosity. Lives that are lived in constant service to the other, not because we must perform some service to repay our debt to Jesus, because we can't do that, but because we wish to embody the sacrificial love of Christ for our neighbor. According to Luther, there's only one thing we need, only one thing, and that one thing is the word of God, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Scripture, it's scripture that leads us to two things. First, the recognition of our weakness and our sin and our need for salvation. And the word of God points us directly to our supposed 21st century freedoms to think only of the self as nothing more than bondage to sin and death. Secondly, the word of God proclaims to us the sure and certain promise of the cross and salvation contained therein. The promises of God are full of goodness for you and for me and for the world that exists out there beyond us. They are words of life and salvation. They lead us to, as Luther writes, serve God joyfully and without thought of gain in love that is not constrained. And we should be guided in all our works by this thought, by this thought, that we may serve and benefit others in all that we do, considering nothing except the need an advantage of our neighbor. That is freedom. But you know, 504 years after Luther nailed the 95 theses to the Wittenberg door, we still struggle with the concept. Jesus himself had quite the conversation about freedom with the Jew Jewish leaders who had believed in him. And their argument to him was, well, we're already free. We're already free because we're children of Abraham. We don't need nothing else. They admitted that little bit about being slaves in Egypt all that time. But anyhow, they didn't recognize their need for anything or anyone. They were confidently standing on their inheritance through Abraham. But Jesus says, no, no. Just know. It doesn't matter who you're re related to or what your ethnicity or nationality is. It doesn't matter how big and bright your flag is. It doesn't matter who you know or how armed you are or how much security surrounds your house. It doesn't matter your political affiliation. The only thing that's going to make you free is Jesus. Just Jesus. And what Jesus frees you for is love of your neighbor. And we don't have to look far in scripture to know that our neighbor isn't just the person who lives next door to us, who looks like us and drives the same car as us and sends their kids to the same soccer practice as us. Our neighbor is anyone, anyone in any need, anyone in any hunger, anyone in any want, anyone to whom we can respond with generosity, love and compassion like Jesus, responded to us before we even asked for it. Jesus has generously welcomed us, welcomed us into his kingdom and calls us to do the same for others, to offer a welcome and set a place at the table, to hand out food, to collect coats, to welcome the stranger, to advocate for the voiceless. Jesus calls us to work for the kingdom of God, not for our salvation, but for the kingdom, freed to care and love and live for the good of all our neighbors. Caring for our neighbors and love people is our generous work, not to earn our salvation, but because we are free. We are free in Christ. Amen.
Let us confess our common Christian faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Set free from sin and death and nourished by the word of truth, we join in prayer for all of God's creation. We pray for all who long for a word of truth and for the radical grace that flows from the cross. Inspire congregations to freely and boldly proclaim your love for all people with persistence and hope. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. We pray for your creation for mountains, rivers, streams, cities, homesteads, and neighborhoods. Write in our hearts a new love and care for creation. Give us the will to curb wasteful habits and to hold accountable those who neglect the vulnerable. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. We pray for all who aspire to public office and for all who will vote on Tuesday at local polling places. Pour wisdom and understanding upon all who govern so that communities of justice and peace may thrive. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. We pray for all who long for healing in mind, body, or spirit, especially Strengthen hospitals, clinics, counseling centers, nursing homes, and recovery centers to be holy spaces of renewal that all might live the abundant life you intend. Hear us, O God. We pray for all who seek to grow in faith and in, in love of you. Guide teaching and learning in confirmation, small groups, Sunday school, uh, youth groups, schools, seminaries, and universities. Hear us, O God. We give thanks for all the saints and reformers who have gone before us, who dwell in your holy habitation. Give us courage through their example to challenge unjust systems and work toward life-giving reformation. Hear us, O God. Mercy is great. Hear now the deepest desires of our hearts. Prayers for those who are isolated, whether physically or emotionally, comfort them with your love. Prayers for world leaders gathered to discuss the climate, inspire them to take the steps to protect our world. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. Confident that you hear us, O oh God, we boldly place our prayers into your hands through Jesus Christ, our truth and life. Amen. This is Donna Hedstrom, and she's going to tell us what motivated her to work on God's Work Our Hands today. All right. Now, this God's Work Our Hands, I used to do frequently when we did it. And ever since I've had some health problems, I have kind of not done what I felt led to do in my heart. But I figured now it's the time to put my hands to work and do something for the Lord. Thank you, Donna. This is Larry Dennis. I feel that it's necessary for us to uh, take care of uh, those less fortunate 
and uh, I've had some uh, experience with uh, Will with uh, Willow um, Abuse and Violence Center, and I know what a great job they do. So I was motivated to come and help do that and provide them with what's needed. Thank you. This is Joyce King. I feel like I should be here helping other people instead of sitting home and not doing anything like I have been doing the last couple of days. And I feel God wants me here, otherwise I wouldn't be here. Oh Lord, forgive our fears that so, so strive for our stewardship. Find us a hope is in standing up and risking and taking our stewardship seriously. Help us to remember, oh Lord, the stewardship questions is not really of some stewardship question is, how will we spend what we have been given? We pray it will be faithfully and sweet. I invite you to stand as you are able for the communion liturgy. <clears throat> the Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Holy God, our bread of life, our table and our food. You created a world in which all might be satisfied by your abundance. You dined with Abraham and Sarah, promising them life, and fed your people Israel with manna from heaven. You sent your son to eat with sinners and to become food for the world. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread. He gave thanks and broke it. He gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. It is shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Remembering, therefore, his life given for us and his rising from the grave, we await his coming again to share with us the everlasting feast. By your spirit, nurture and sustain us with this meal. Strengthen us to serve all in hunger and want. And by this bread and cup, make of us the body of your Son. Through him, all glory and honor is yours, Almighty Father, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, both now and forever. Amen. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Friends in Christ, you are free, free to come to this meal, free to leave it in service to your neighbor. Come, be fed.
shouts of joy, bearing witness to the abundance of your love in Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. People of God, you are Christ's body, freed in Jesus Christ to bring new life to a suffering world. The Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit bless you, now and forever. Amen.
Christ is with you. Thanks be to God.